welcome everyone. Uh, I am going to introduce our speaker today, Rad. Uh, Rad is an assistant professor at the University of Chicago Booth uh, School of Business in the operations management area. Uh, prior to joining Booth, he was a postdoc researcher in the Mark Algo Group at the Google Research New York and a, a Motwani postdoctoral fellow at the Stanford University Department of Computer Science. Uh, he received his PhD in computer science, minored in applied mathematics from Cornell University. Uh, Rad studies the interplay between algorithms, incentives, and learning with the goal of advancing the theoretical methodologies and foundations of uh, market design and operations uh, in dynamic and complex environments. Uh, he has received the INFORMS Revenue Management and Pricing Dissertation Award Honorable Mention in 2018 the Google PhD Fellowship in Market Algorithms in 2016, the Stanford Motwani Fellowship in 2017, and the Cornell Jacobs Fellowship in 2012 for his research. Uh, today, he is going to talk about uh, near optimal experimental design for networks. Uh, please welcome our speaker. Um, thanks, Jimmy, for the introduction, and thanks for the invitation. It feels really great uh, to be back here after about a year and a half. Uh, maybe not the best year and a half for for all of us, but it was what it was. Um, yeah, um, so today I'm going to talk about Near Optimal Experimental Design for Network, which is a joint work with my colleague at Chicago Booth, Ozan Kandogan, and our postdoc, uh, Chen Chen. Uh, so before proceeding to the talk, let me actually do a little bit of advertisement uh, for my postdoc, Chen. Chen is amazing. He's on the job market this year, and he's actually the main driving force behind uh, this paper. Chen has been with us for about a year and a half, uh, has been working on different questions at the intersection of computational optimization, approximation algorithms, and what they call algorithmic data science. And the paper that I'm uh, giving the talk on is basically part of this agenda. Uh, so if I can convince you by the end of this talk that Chen's work is Great, you should contact him, and I'm uh, pretty sure he has more to say about this project. All right, so I'm going to talk about experiments, and maybe uh, experiments and running experiments essentially is one of the most ancient scientific methods throughout history that has been used in order to gather more information about unknown phenomena. And this very same basic concept has found a different meaning in our uh, modern uh, times. And I would say it has been metamorphosed into a very exciting and impactful area called experimental design. And experimental design is basically the science of designing randomized tests, for example, A-B testing, which I call them in this talk experiments, to essentially measure the effectiveness of an intervention. For example, imagine you are a drug company, you have a new drug, you discovered a new drug, you would like to measure its effectiveness. And then you start running an A-B testing by putting population into two groups, treatment and control, and you try to measure the effectiveness of this drug there. Or maybe you're an online platform, let's say Uber, uh, you have a new search pricing algorithm, you would like to see how effective it, it's that in maximizing the size of the matching maybe, and then you start running an experiment in the same fashion. Historically speaking, I should say that experimental design is basically a uh, celebrated branch of statistics. It has its roots to the seminal work of Fisher back in 1935. But then these days, it has found a wide range of applications, from designing clinical trials to even examining constitutional laws. But then in this talk, I'm not going to talk about these applications. I'm going to put my market design hat on. And I'm going to basically focus on experimental design as a tool in online marketplaces and especially social networks when you would like to make data-driven product decisions. And the high-level goal that we are pursuing this talk is really designing randomized experiments that can estimate what I call the total market effect, which is the difference in the total generated outcome of all the users or total generated behavior of all the users when the intervention is introduced to the entire market. And this is really what makes this problem challenging, uh, this kind of like causal effect where you're comparing the counterfactual outcomes with the realized outcomes under intervention. And this is why experimental design is kind of uh, using a lot of interesting ideas. 
So as an experimental designer, if you are living in an ideal world, you would like to have access to your experimental units in isolation, meaning that you can do whatever you want with that experimental unit, and that's not going to affect any other experimental unit that uh, is under your control. So this very unrealistic scenario has a name in this literature called uh, SUTVA, a stable unit treatment value assumption. It's kind of an assumption that basically says that if this assumption holds, then the observation you get on one unit should not be affected by the assignment of other experimental units to either treatment or control. So it seems to be very strong, and it is actually very strong in most of the applications, including applications in online platforms and networks. This assumption simply doesn't hold because of a very simple phenomenon called interference. And interference is exactly the opposite. So basically, we say we have interference when assignment of one user to treatment or control can affect the outcome of another uh, user uh, un under the experiment. And this interference can easily happen because of maybe explicit network effects. For example, in a social network like Facebook, if you are modifying the news feed of one uh, user in the platform, then the friends of that user probably have a different behavior. This basically the existence of this social link between the two users has created the interference when you are running an experiment on Facebook. And sometimes this network effect is really implicit. And you see a lot of examples of this sort in online marketplaces due to substitution and limited supply. For example, let's say Lyft is running an experiment to measure the effectiveness of the prime time subsidies. So prime time is like search prices. Uh, Lyft might want to subsidize this in order to give more incentives to the riders to use the platform. And then it runs an experiment. There are a couple of riders they're sharing some number of drivers in probably a neighborhood. And then the problem is uh, you really would like to understand the total market effect. But then when you put individual riders in your treatment group and you give them the prime time subsidy, you overestimate the effectiveness of the prime time subsidy because you're by putting the other riders in the control group, you're actually decreasing the competition. So in this way, these two riders, the outcomes they are generating are affected, not because there is a link between them, but because they are sharing the same supply node. In this case, maybe a driver. And again, this network effect is going to uh, damage the experiment designer by, by producing interference. So one thing that can help us is a particular structure that you see in the interference pattern of many of these applications. Uh, for example, this is an example of a subnetwork of Facebook coming from Stanford Snap data set in 2012 in McAlee and uh, Leshkovic paper. Uh, as you can see, uh, basically the social network has been uh, divided into disjoint communities with a small number of cross edges between their communities. And this natural structure exists in this application and actually it will help us to uh, design better experiments, as I'm going to explain uh, soon in the talk. But sometimes this natural structure does not exist, but then the designer divides the marketplace, partitions the marketplace into clusters with the hope of having clusters that are densely connected. Basically, in each of these communities, the experimental units can have a lot of interference on each other, but then there are not that many small edges across these communities. So the uh, picture you see on this slide is basically the prime time subsidy experiment run by Lyft and how they divide the marketplace at different levels of granularity depending on uh, what kind of uh, experiment they would like to run. But the bottom line is either it comes naturally or it comes as an artifact of a designer partitioning the marketplace into disjoint communities. In many, many of these applications, at the end, you are dealing with the interference pattern that has almost disjoint communities with a small number of cross community edges. And in such a situation, one design approach that is prevalent in practice and helps with alleviating interference is using what I call cluster-based or community level randomized experiments. So this is a binary experiment, kind of like an A-B test, which starts by partitioning the network into disjoint communities, sometimes this uh, communities are natural structures. Sometimes they are uh, created by using a clustering algorithm, maybe. 
And then what it does is it assigns all the users in the same community to the same treatment or control variants. So this design approach is kind of uh, helpful because as long as you guarantee an unbiased estimation for the part of the market effect that is for one of these communities, then you will have the unbiasedness of the estimator for the entire market. Basically, as long as I have an estimator for each of these communities, I can add up these estimators. And then this gives me an unbiased estimator for the total market effect, as long as each of these individual estimators are unbiased. Or let's say if they are almost unbiased, then the final estimator is going to be almost unbiased. And this fact simply holds because of the existence of not that many cross edges creating interference across these communities. And then for obtaining an unbiased estimator in each of these sections, you can probably use uh, unbiased estimators such as Horvath Thompson estimator, or you can use other uh, classic estimators that induce a little bit of bias uh, and in return create less variance. For example, the Hayek estimator. But uh, one task is having an unbiasedness in these applications, and this is kind of not a very difficult objective to achieve. But then the research question that I would like to actually address in this talk is the following. Given an unbiased estimator, let's say Thomson Horvitz estimator, how can I design, let's say, a computationally efficient community level randomized assignment that is near optimal or approximate optimal in terms of minimizing the variance of the estimator? And the reason I'm focusing on the variance is because at the end of the day, when you design an estimator, all you care about is the statistical power of the estimator. So bias is one thing that you have to be worried about. But at the same time, you really need a small variance in order to use that estimator. And then we try to design a basic economy level randomized experiment in this talk that targets the variance of a classic uh, unbiased or almost unbiased estimators such as Horvitz Thompson estimator or Hayek estimator. So for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to uh, focus on Thompson Horvitz, but uh, in the paper, you can actually find arguments about other type of uh, estimators. All right. One thing that I have to say is there are different models that you can consider for potential outcomes that are generated um, after you run an experiment. And in this talk, I'm actually focusing on a particular uh, model called the worst case potential or adversarial potential outcome model. Um, and once I uh, tell you about the model, everything will be completely clear. All right, cool. So with this uh, brief introduction, let me actually jump directly into the model. So we are considering a platform that conducts a binary experiment in a network with M users. Each user, as a result of the experiment, is going to receive either of the two uh, variants, uh, either treatment denoted by one or control denoted by zero. And then we consider a particular exposure model. And I should say that it can be relaxed to other exposure model. And there is a discussion in the paper about that. Uh, so this exposure model is essentially saying that uh, there are two types of outcomes, uh, treatment outcome and control outcome. And as long as a user and all of his neighbors are assigned to the treatment assignment, then the user is going to experience the treatment outcome. And if the user and all of his neighbors are assigned to the control uh, uh, assignment, then the user is going to have the control outcome. So for example, in this figure, uh, the, this user on the left is assigned to treatment, and all of his neighbors are assigned to treatment. So this user is going to have the treatment outcome denoted by yj1. j is the index of the user. And the user on the right-hand side is assigned to the control variant, and all of his neighbors are assigned to the control variant. So it's going to have the control outcome yj0. And then if you have a user that has a mixture, then this user is going to basically assign to null or irre irrelevant outcome. So now our goal is really trying to estimate the total market effect, which is the sum of the uh, treatment outcomes among all the users minus the sum of the control outcomes uh, among all the users. And 
In order to estimate this quantity, we're going to use an unbiased Horvitz Thompson estimator, for example, tau hat, which is basically applying importance, important sampling to this uh, particular application, trying to have an unbiased estimator for this quantity, which is sum of the yj's minus the sum of the five yj ones minus the sum of the yj zeros. All right. So Thompson Horvitz sampling is, or estimator in this case, is basically nothing but just some of the assigned uh, treatment outcomes divided by the probability that the unit gets treatment minus the sum of the assigned control outcomes divided by the probability that the unit gets control. And if you take the expectation of this quantity, as we have all seen in uh, Statistics 101, this is actually an unbiased estimator for the total market effect. And now the question is basically solving the following min-max optimization problem. Uh, with the goal of minimizing the variance of the horvitz thompson estimator against the worst case choice of potential outcomes. So the way to think about it is basically there are two players in this game. One player is picking an experiment, which is a distribution over treatment control assignments over the network of users. And then <clears throat> there is a second player, the adversary, which is picking let's say a vector of non-negative and bounded potential outcomes, one for each user for treatment and one for each user for control, so as to maximize the variance of the estimator. We are also focusing on symmetric assignments uh, as a side of the experiment designer in the sense that we are looking at experiments when you change the label of treatments to control and vice versa, the distribution really doesn't change. And this is almost without loss of charity, but it's going to make uh, a lot of calculations and analysis in the paper uh, much nicer. So we are looking at this particular class for experiments. And now the real challenge is that finding the optimal min-max experiment, which is solving this min-max optimization problem, seems to be computationally uh, uh, intractable. In, in fact, you can show that this mean max can be solved using an exponential size LP with exponentially many variables and also exponentially many constraints. As far as I know, there is no succinct representation for the optimal solution of this mean max. Uh, it's not easy to sample. And even if you manage to solve it for a small instance of the problem, it is pretty hard to interpret. And then in contrast to this, we try to design simple and computationally efficient randomized experiments that have provable performance guarantees against the benchmark, which is the solution of this mean max optimization problem. And throughout the talk, as I mentioned at the beginning in the motivation part, we're going to focus on a particular network that can be partitioned into disjoint communities by dropping a small number of connections. And actually, for the purpose of this talk, I'm just going to focus on the case where the communities are completely disjoint. So you have densely connected components that there are no edges across them. And this is basically the network that is given. And <clears throat> now, rather than considering an arbitrary experiment, we're actually considering community-level randomized assignments, which are experiments that assign the same treatment or control variant to each uh, user in the same community. It's basically, all the users in the same community, they get the same variant. And now the name of the game is really finding the appropriate correlation structure among these communities in order to minimize the worst case values. And even this is a smaller problem, which actually you can show it is without the subjectivity, uh, almost uh, close to the finding the optimal experiment for this special case of uh, networks, it still admits uh, computational non-tractability because finding the correlation structure is still uh, requiring solving an LP with exponential size, uh, meaning that exponential number of variables and exponential many constraints. So really, in terms of computational benefit, you get nothing by moving to community level randomized assignment. But then you can start thinking about how to design approximations to the optimal experiment. And this is exactly what we will do uh, in this paper. So that brings us to the main result of this uh, talk which is maybe a first step towards having an algorithmic experimental uh, design progress for networks. So what we do is we design a family of simple and computationally efficient algorithmic experiments, which I'm going to call them independent block randomization, or RBR. Uh, as we will see, they have uh, a lot of properties. 
First of all, they are community level randomized assignment and they induce a particular negative correlation structure among the communities. Second, as we will see, they are kind of practical, very intuitive and interpretable. It's easy to describe to an engineer what this experiment is and why it feels to be the right uh, way of creating or engineering negative correlation across the communities. It has provable constant factor approximations against all instances of the problem. And then for practical instances of the problem, basically in practical regimes of parameters of the problem, uh, we can show it has provable near optimal guarantees. And finally, in numerical simulations on uh, practical instances of this problem through data, we observed a much better performance guarantee versus the theoretical guarantees that we could prove. All right. OK, so there is a long list of uh, work related to experimental design, especially with the focus on networks and online platforms. Uh, I would consider them as the intersection of CS, Econ, OR, and STAT. Uh, some people in this audience have worked on some of these questions, including Jean. So for in the interest of time, I'm not actually going to do the literature review, but please feel free to ask me questions about any of this work. I would be happy to uh, answer and also take a look at the paper for a more in-depth literature review. So let me jump to the community level randomized assignments and how one can think about the independent block randomization in this context. Any questions so far? OK. All right. So uh, as I said, without loss of generality, we are going to restrict our attention to designing community level randomized experiments. Uh, now, what we can say is, imagine we have n disjoint communities. Community i is denoted by si. Basically, si are the users in community i. Imagine each community i contains wi number of users. So we have different communities of different sizes. Community i has size wi. Uh, we assume that the users in the same community are densely connected. And the definition of densely connected is kind of uh, high level in this talk, but in the paper we have different uh, abstract and non-abstract definitions for densely connected. For the purpose of this talk and uh, related to the exposure model that I had at the beginning, you can imagine that a densely connected component basically means that each two users in the same community, they either uh, are neighbors or they have a common neighbor. Now we are studying community level assignments, which are assignments that basically assign the same treatment or control variant to all the users in the same community. And then because of the symmetric assumption, they do so by symmetrically picking the treatment or control. Basically, the marginal distribution that you see on each of these communities is basically assigning how, uh, all the users to treatment with priority half and all the users to control with priority half. And the final distribution of treatment assignment comes from these marginal distributions combined with a correlation across the communities. And now you can show the following. So you can show that if you're restricting your attention to the community level assignments, then uh, in the worst case, when the second player, the adversary, is picking the potential outcomes, then it's going to pick a vector of potential outcomes that has a particular structure. So first of all, all the users in the same community are going to have the same uh, treatment and control potential outcome in the worst case. Second, it's going to be integral. Basically, we assume that the outcomes are between 0 and 1. So you can show under the worst case, they are going to either be 0 or 1. And finally, you can show that because of the symmetric assumption, the adversary has really no reason to have a different potential outcome for treatment versus control under the worst case uh, setting. And therefore, uh, the worst case potential outcome is going to be equal under the treatment and control. So that brings down the uh, in the worst case for community i. And it really doesn't matter whether you're looking at treatment or control. And this yi is going to be either 0 when all the users have uh, 0 outcome. Or it can be wi when all the users in the community are going to have wi outcome. 
Now, the variance of the Horvitz-Thompson estimator can be described in the following way. So the variance is going to be four times y transpose sigma y, where sigma is the correlation matrix of the treatment assignments across these communities. So with this simplification, this very simple lemma, you can now uh, simplify the problem and define a new optimization problem, a new mean max problem, where we have two players. The mean player is trying to find a joint distribution, the treatment assignment distribution across the communities. The max player is picking a vector y, one uh, coordinate for each community. yi is a number that is either 0 or wi. And the objective that we have in this mean max is simply going to be some constant 4 times y transpose sigma y, where sigma is the correlation matrix of the joint treatment assignments of the communities. OK, so this is the optimization problem. And I claim that it actually admits almost all the computational intractability of the original problem, simply because, again, uh, in order to uh, look at the search of the experiments, the experiment designer really need to search over distributions over uh, binary vectors. And for each distribution, it's going to be an induced correlation matrix, but the correlation matrix, the space of correlation matrices can be only described using distribution over binary assignments. So again, if you solve, if you write this as a linear program, you can uh, solve it as long as you have exponentially many variables and exponentially many constraints. Constraints come from the inner maximization problem. And if you manage to solve it for a special instances or a small instance of the problem, the correlation structure can be very complicated. I'm going to show you uh, in the next slide how complicated that, complicated that can be. And then finally, it is highly non-practical because as you will see, sometimes the optimal correlation structure you get from this mean max will induce weird type of correlations across community things that you won't expect by just like looking at the problems. So it's kind of like a very counterintuitive solution, but it is still optimal. To just get a better sense, let's actually uh, take a look uh, back at the Facebook example. In the Facebook example I showed you, there are essentially seven communities. These are the community sizes, as you can see on this slide. And one can solve this mean max optimization to find the correlation matrix of the optimal community level randomized uh, assignment. And this is going to be the matrix that you get, the 7 by 7 matrix. And this is kind of a funny uh, assignment. First of all, it's going to randomize over 36 possible assignment vectors with different probabilities. So it's a kind of a very complex solution. At the same time, as you can see, it even sometimes induces positive correlation among these communities, which I personally found very weird when I saw this uh, numerical simulation for the first time. Because you kind of expect that negative correlation is what you need in order to bring down the variance. But as it appears, because of the fact that these communities they have different sizes, sometimes you benefit from inducing positive correlation across these communities. And this is a type of result that is really hard to interpret. And it's really hard to explain to an engineer that, hey, this is probably how you want to correlate the experiments that you're running across different neighbors of city of Denver. And these kind of like complications uh, made us to think about what if we look at very special case of this problem when the community sizes, they have equal size. Basically, the community sizes are all equal to each other. And then it turned out that actually in this very special case, the problem, the finding the optimal committee uh, level assignment is easy to solve, and the optimal solution is very well structured. So let's look at this very simple uh, special case when all the communities they have equal size. Let's say SI is equal to WI is equal to 1 for all the communities. Now, this is the optimal experiment. So the optimal experiment in this very special case uh, is really trying to maximize the negative correlation across the communities. So what it does is picking half of the communities uniformly at random, assign that half to treatment, and assign the remaining half to control. And that will give you basically a correlation matrix that has the following structure, all one on the diagonal, as uh, like any other correlation matrix. And then you have 
off diagonals that are equal to minus one over n minus one over n, depending on whether n is odd or even. So the way to really think about this matrix is this is the maximally negatively correlated correlation matrix that you can have. Uh, and the reason is basically a correlation matrix should be diagonally dominant. So if you want to create the maximum negative correlation, then you are going to end up with having off diagonals that are equal to minus one over n minus one, so that you will still have the diagonal dominance uh, on each of the rows of this matrix. And the reason that when communities they have equal size, you would like to create the maximum negative correlation is basically related to the fact that a worst case adversary in this case is going to pick a worst case potential outcome equal to one for all, each of these communities. And now the experiment in order to minimize the variance should negatively correlate all these communities as much as it can. And one uh, funny fact is if you compare the variance of this uh, negatively correlated experiment with the variance of independent assignment, then you, you see a gap of four. So there is really a price of independence in this example. Uh, and this is a very simple ex experiment which can be described in words. But unfortunately, this is not going to be optimal or near optimal when you look at uh, a general instance of the problem when the communities, they have different sizes. So our challenge was coming up with the generalization of this uh, very simple experiment that can work when different communities, they have different sizes. And that brought us to the independent block randomization. So we propose this, uh, I would say, family of experiments, uh, independent block randomization. Uh, so an independent block randomization experiment is defined the following way. You first start by sorting the n different communities based on their sizes, sort by communities in decreasing order of their sizes. Then partition. Uh, these communities into consecutive blocks so that each block contains basic communities of similar sizes. So I'm going to define these blocks on top of my communities. And then my experiment is going to do the following. So it's going to randomly assign half of the communities in each block to treatment and the remaining half to control, basically mimics the optimal experiment for equal sizes within each uh, block. And it uh, does so in an independent fashion across the different blocks. So you have n different communities, first defined block somehow. I'm going to explain how to uh, basically find these blocks. Then within each block, treat it as uh, a group of communities with the same size. Find the optimal uh, experiment if the communities had the same size within each block. And then do so independently across the block. So this defines the independent block randomization policy. And to just like compare the correlation matrix of this uh, experiment with the optimal, so optimal one has this kind of complex correlation matrix on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you will see the correlation matrix of an IBR experiment. Uh, these are the blocks. Uh, outside of these blocks, you have zero because of the independence across the blocks. Within each block, you really have uh, the same correlation matrix as, the, as of the correlation matrix of the uh, optimal experiment for equal sizes. In this sigma one is basically minus one over the size of the block. Sigma two is minus one over the size of the block, so on and so forth. So this is kind of like a well-engineered negative correlation across these uh, communities. So it gives us a theoretical handle to analyze these experiments. And on top of that, actually, you can show because of the fact that the variance is an additive function across these blocks because of the independence, if you want to minimize the variance within this family, you can come up with a simple DP, dynamic program, to compute the optimal partition into the blocks. So restricting to this family, uh, as I'm not going to explain the details, but it's not actually that difficult to come up with a dynamic program that can give you the optimal uh, partitioning. So then there is this optimal independent block randomization policy that you can always come up with. It is simple and computationally efficient. And now we try to actually analyze that particular policy. So before getting to analyzing the optimal or DP-based IBR experiment, I would like to say a few words about uh, what you lose and what you gain when you switch from an optimal experiment to uh, IBR experiment. It really uh, comes from just staring at the correlation matrix of an IBR experiment. 
So here are the gains that we get. So compared to any other experiment, we are obtaining a, ne a larger negative correlation within each block. And these blocks are supposed to have communities of almost similar sizes. So as long as you create maximum negative correlation across these communities, you should be happy. So this is one gain that you get by uh, blocking and then creating uh, this kind of negative correlation within each block. But at the same time, you also gain from in introducing zero correlation across some of the communities that probably they needed to be positively correlated uh, in the optimal experiment versus if you had everything in one block where you could create negative correlation. So zero correlation is better than negative correlation. So in that way, you also kind of like gain. But at the same time, while you are gaining these two uh, points, you're losing two points. So the first point that you lose is coming from the fact that, first of all, in this com in this block, even though you try to put communities of almost same size in the same block, they might have different sizes. So this is not really even optimal for that block. And second is that, well, so we are always creating negative correlation here. But uh, the fact is, uh, Sometimes here we also have like independent across the communities. And then you look at like the borderline of two, two of these blocks, you have two blocks that they have similar sizes, even though they belong to two different blocks, they have similar sizes. And you are assigning independently to these two communities, which is against the philosophy of assigning negatively correlated uh, treatments to communities that have same sizes based on what we saw uh, for the special case of equal size uh, randomized, community level randomized experiment. So you, you gain these two and you lose these two points. And in fact, you can minimize these two losses by carefully designing the community partition using the dynamic program. And if you manage to uh, think carefully about these gains and losses, then you can actually prove something about this class. And here is our main theoretical result in this paper. Basically, we show that if you look at the optimal IBR experiment, then the worst case variance of this optimal experiment is going to be a 7 over 3, 2.33 approximation of the uh, worst case variance of the optimal experiment. This is true for any instance of this problem. And second, we show asymptotic optimality in the sense that if you look at this ratio, the difference between the variance of the optimal library experiment and the optimal community level assignment divided by the variance of the optimal community level assignment, then this ratio is actually equal to uh, order a square root of the size of the largest community square divided by some of the squares of all the community sizes. And as n goes to infinity and you have no community that is dominating the rest, basically the largest community is a sub sublinear in the size of all the communities, then this is going to converge to zero. And that gives us the asymptotic optimality. And by the way, these assumptions, they hold in the social network uh, uh, with appropriate uh, randomized assumptions on how the network is generated, which I'm not going to go through the details, but uh, this is why I call this a practical regime of the problem. And I claim that the IBR experiment, the optimal IBR experiment is near optimal in that practical regime. And I should say that in numerical studies, we saw substantial more improvement uh, than what we have in this theoretical result. Let me try to uh, give some high level ideas of, of how this proof works. So the first proof is re really trying to have a better theoretical handle on the min-max optimization that I showed you. So in this min-max op optimization, the outer minimization problem is a search over the space of all the correlation matrices of binary assignments. And this is an exponential size uh, set. But one can actually relax this. And rather than restricting to binary assignments, assume that you can restrict to any kind of fractional assignment. And therefore, you can relax this set to be basically the set of all the correlation matrices that can be induced by a vector of random variables, let's say real-valued random variables. 
And then this set essentially becomes basically a set of all the PSD matrices, pulse system with the field matrices that have all diagonal entries. And this is just a relaxation to our problem. So if you relax the outer problem, then this gives you a lower bound on the optimal variance or the minimum variance of the optimal experiments under the worst case potential outcomes. So this is going to be the benchmark that we are going to use. Second step, we try to find lower bounds on this benchmark and upper bounds on this benchmark. So the upper bound simply comes from what you get if you use an independent assignment. And then for coming up with some weight dependent lower bounds, what we do is basically trying to design a good adversary for this problem. And then for each adversary, we try to find the optimal experiment for that adversary. Then that gives us these kinds of bounds that again, give us another level of theoretical handle over uh, the benchmark. And then finally, we, rather than analyzing a DP based, we analyze a surrogate IBR experiment, which is what I call the K partition. So K partition is simply looking at every K communities after you sort the communities based on their sizes, and then uh, consider each of these K conse consecutive communities as one block. And then in each of these blocks, it actually runs the DP to find uh, the optimal IBR experiment inside this block. And that gives us a K partition IBR experiment. As it turned out that this is, again, give, giving us another theoretical handle to uh, say something about the optimal DP-based IBR experiment. And we have this lemma. I'm not going to go through the details, which is basically analyzing a K partition IBR experiment. And by combining the lower bound in step two and thinking carefully about the variance of the K partition IBR experiment, we end up by sh we end up showing that the best K partition IBR experiment, uh, which happens at K equal to four, will obtain the seven over three approximation factor that I promised you earlier in the talk. All right. So in the interest of time, let me actually uh, skip the asymptotic optimality part. I'm just going to show you some numerical simulations, and then I'm going to conclude the talk. So let's go back to the Facebook example. Um, when we started working on this example, we needed to come up with this joint community. So we just partitioned the network using the classic Leuven algorithm. And in order to not have that many cross edges across the community, we merge any two communities where the amount of contamination from one community to another was more than 10%. So then the resulting uh, basically clustering gave us seven different communities of different sizes where only 6% of users are contaminated. And by contaminated, I really mean uh, a user belongs to one community but has an edge from another community. All right, so the interference pattern really can be uh, partition into seven almost disjoint communities. And as a reminder, uh, if you solve the solve for the optimal community level randomized assignment, then you're going to come up with a distribution over 36 binary vectors, which is kind of a complex distribution. And this was the correlation matrix that uh, was induced by that distribution over 36 possible assignments. And as I mentioned earlier, it is kind of weird. It has you know, this kind of like uh, positive correlation between some of the communities. By just like looking at it, you really cannot understand what's going on, et cetera. And now one can ask the question, what happens if you find the optimal block structure and then run an IBR experiment on top of uh, those blocks? What would the correlation matrix look like, et cetera? And the result was kind of surprising, basically. Uh, you are going to come up with two blocks, only two blocks. Uh, within each block, we have to pick half of the communities uniformly at random, assign them to treatment, and the remaining half to control. And this is going to be the resulting correlation matrix of the optimal IBR experiment for this instance. And now if we want to compare the performance in terms of variance, as it turned out, the optimal IBR experiment only gives you 7% more variance versus the optimal uh, experiment or optimal community level experiment. But then let's actually compare it with two heuristics. The first one is 
randomly treating half of the communities, basically assuming that all the communities, they had the same sizes and running the optimal experiment on that, uh, under that assumption uh, without the assumption really being true. And that gives us 31% more variance versus the optimal experiment. The other heuristic is really treating the communities independently, which at the first place, by the way, sounded like maybe the right way of trying to design an optimal experiment for this problem, because you have you know, these joint communities, why on earth should you induce correlation between them? But as it turns out, because of the fact that you're estimating total market effect, so negative correlation help, is helpful, and you can see it completely in this numerical simulation by treating the communities independently, you're gonna have twice variance versus the optimal experiment. And with that, let me conclude my talk. So we study what I call robust experimental design in a network of users, robust in the sense that we are not considering a stochastic model for potential outcomes. We really try to design an experiment that works for any realizable potential outcomes for both treatment and control. What we do is we uh, design and propose simple family of uh, computation efficient experiments called IBR, which are constant factor approximation for every problem instance and they are near optimal in practical regimes. And I would say the operational takeaway of this talk should be that if you are designing a cluster-based randomized experiment, try to add one feature in your clustering, which is the sizes, put communities of the same size in the same block in some way. We have this dynamic programming, but maybe there are other heuristics that can work. And then after you design these blocks, treat each block as if all the communities in that block, they had the same size. And this will help you to reduce the variance of uh, traditional, uh, or let's say classic estimators for the total market effect, things such as Horvitz-Thompson estimator or Hayek estimator. And there are a lot of avenues for future work. For example, we are currently working on the optimal bias variance trade off here. As I told you, you might pick the Horvitz-Thompson estimator, which is unbiased no matter what, and try to minimize the variance, but one might like to change the estimator to something else that induces a little bit more bias, but in return creates more variance. And that might actually help with increasing the statistical power of the estimator. This is one thing that we are thinking about. And the second one is really trying to uh, implement this experiment uh, and run careful empirical studies on real data or ideally in an online platform to see how well they perform versus other forms of uh, cluster-based randomization or cluster-based randomized experiments. And with that, I would like to end the talk. Thanks a lot for your attention. I think we have some time for questions. We'd be happy to take any questions that you guys have. I, I have some questions. Um, okay. Also, uh, it's a really great talk, so, so thank you. I. Um, a few comments just before just before mm -hmm. my question. Um, I hadn't seen a lot of papers use this worst case uh, potential outcome um, stuff. But I think that's really neat. Um, it's I think a little bit more like robust than assuming a lot of the potential outcomes model that people look at. Um, so that's cool. The other thing that was I thought I thought was really cool was um, the idea behind IV like your independent block randomized design. I feel like in practice, a lot of times we sort of force ourselves to have balanced clusters mm -hmm. to this problem of, of variance. And that's a constraint that's actually kind of hard to work with because you sacrifice on how like um, not independent your clusters are. And so having a framework that allows you to handle varying cluster sizes is really nice. I had two questions uh, yes. and they're really just on your, on your assumptions. Um, um, one is you, you you look at symmetric. This I wasn't sure whether that was like crucial to the results or whether it was just for simplifying like the the proofs. But you think they will they would still go through. Uh, great question. So I, I have one good answer and one bad answer. So the good answer is really for uh, the results to go through, we needed that symmetric assumption. So it's just not an artifact of like simplification if we 
drop that, then the results are going to still be true as they are written in the paper. So basically, the symmetric assumption is equivalent to saying that the probability of assigning null outcome in each of these committees is zero. So basically, when you have the symmetric assumption, you say, hey, in, in each of these communities, half of the times the unit is going to be assigned to treatment, half of the time it's going to be assigned to control. And there is no room for uh, the null outcome. That's one implication it has. And that implication actually uh, helps with a lot of the steps of the proof. Having said that, I believe it's not an essential assumption, meaning that you can drop the symmetric assumption and still uh, show something, but we were not able to do so. But yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the first yeah, one I mean, is, the is because like, in a lot of these, I mean, in a lot of tech companies like Facebook, I guess, or, or Google, um, it's it's rare to run 50% experiments, of course. Um, so that's why I was wondering. Right, exactly. Um, Anyway, the, thanks for the thanks for the answer. The other question I had was so in this worst case model that I actually was not very familiar with, you assume I guess that the potential outcomes are bounded, and you make this very natural assumption that you can just reduce that to zero one for all communities, right, um, without loss of generality. And I, I think that's I think that's very natural, but I wonder how that it changes the results if you have a bound, of course, but that's Different for different communities because um, you have variants. I mean, in, in our in estimations that, that we have, you have variants coming from different cluster sizes, but you also have variants because potential outcomes will be like much larger for some communities than others. So for for Facebook, I imagine there's not too many users that that click a million times more than other users, but yes. in other cases like markets, you can have players that are ten like a hundred or a thousand times larger than other players. Um, uh Great question. Uh, so my answer is basically you can absorb that upper bound on the potential outcome into the sizes. So basically at the end, so even though we assume each user's potential outcome is the number of things zero and one, different communities could have different sizes, number of users. And the final problem you had to solve as the experimental designer was really trying to design a correlation matrix across the communities that minimizes against the worst case potential outcome where adversary could pick a number between zero and WI in each of these communities where the WI was the size of the community. But now imagine if you have like another upper bound for that community on the size of the potential outcome, adversaries, uh, you really change the definition of WI. So rather than WI being the size of the community, it's gonna be basically the sum of the upper bounds that you have on the potential outcomes and everything else will go through. So that assumption was really without a soft generality. Okay, that, uh, that's good to know, thanks. Sure. And again, great talk. Thank you. And then by the way, so one thing I, I want to add related to uh, maybe your first question is, you know, sometimes um, we run, you know, switchback. And uh, there is this paper by Bojinov et al, which they think about these worst case potential outcomes uh, when the experimental design is running switchback mechanisms. And rather than having a spatial interference, they have carryover effects and consider design experiments there. Which is, so if you think about an experimental unit across time as different copies of the same experimental unit, this is again kind of a network, time expanded network, and many of the things that we talked about can be used there. Modulo the difference, one big difference, which is the fact that you really do not have the disjoint community assumption when you think about switchback experiments uh, as basic experimental unit, units that are expanded over time. Um, but yeah, so that paper is great. And it's, it is another example of a paper that uses the worst case potential outcome. So you're trying to extend your 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 model to the switchback design as well? Yeah, so we have a new result, which is basically using some of the ideas in, in the network problem to the switchback problem. Uh, and we are adding a section to the paper. Hopefully, it will be written uh, very soon. Yeah, so basically, we can show how we can obtain the near optimal experiment, switchback experiments. But then this time, we do not rely on IBR experiments. We actually have something which we call the logarithmic partitioning. And that helps us to 
uh, divide different units of time across different, basically they divide different units of time into intervals and then running an independent experiment in each of these intervals. Uh, the intervals are small enough that you can find the optimal experiment within the interval. And then once you concatenate these optimal uh, experiments independently, you end up with a near optimal experiment as a whole. Um, but yeah, so there we are using the particular carryover effect or the memory effect of a switchback experiment, meaning that if I put one unit in treatment, maybe that will affect the same unit across time in the next M time instance, discrete times, right? So there is a there is a memory in the system, maybe constant memory equal to M, and that gives you a particular structure interference pattern. So the question is, given this interference pattern, how we can design an experiment. So we show you can divide it into intervals, r uh, run experiments independently across these intervals, within each interval, actually find the optimal experiment. And then the concatenation will give you near optimality at the end. Yeah, so Bojinov et al. looks at a special class of switchback uh, experiments, and then they show how you can find the optimal within that class. But actually that class, as far as I know, the optimal one is not going to be near optimal without any other assumptions, basically. So they, they restrict the attention to a class that doesn't include neither the optimal or near optimal experiments. And they show how to find the optimal within that class. Near optimal one that is not actually part of that class. <laughs> okay. And that's in their latest paper, uh, the B21? I believe so, yes. Okay. One final question, maybe. <laughs> Would you be able to send us the slides, or I don't know how that. Um... Uh, or of course, Jimmy will be able to. Um, I'll I'll do that. that. Great, thank you. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Uh, if there are no other questions, we can thank the speaker. Yeah. Thanks for having me. It's good to see everyone. Thank you.